And good morning, everybody. And welcome back to Non-Standard Action's run of Fly Free or Die, episode 16, The White Glove Affair. Today we are beginning this chap next chapter in the Adventure Path, also titled The White Glove Affair, by Kendra Lee Speedling. Joining me today are Jet, Leif, Liz, Nick, and Simon. Friends, we are halfway through this AP, which is, first of all, mind-boggling to me. It's really cool. Uh, I've, I've had a great time running it. I wanted uh, to check in with you all because your levels, uh, your characters are, you know, halfway through their projected lifespan, so to speak. How are you feeling so far about the AP? Uh, has it gone the way you thought it would? Has your character grown in a different direction than you initially intended? Surprise, this is also an icebreaker question of sorts, but like one that I- Yeah, that's not nice. You have to you have to give us a few days to think about these, Tom. <laughs> oh, it, no it's, it's terrible. You never should have played this AP. I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Right. I, I, I'm, I kid, I kid. <laughs> I was gonna say I think I think Nick might be might be being facetious there, but yeah, yeah, I think, I, I think it's like roughly met my expectations. Like it, it's always hard to um, it, it's hard, hard to emulate like the feel of a TV show like a uh, Firefly or such. Mm. Um, and I was like a bit worried that we would have like a bunch of like I don't know systems forced upon us. Like in like some other Paizo games, have had like some meta mechanics that have felt very burdensome that I haven't really liked. Um, but I, I don't think that's been the case here. We've sort of like taken on the galactic trading thing, but we've only done it as much as we wanted it. We haven't really felt much pressure to add it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I, uh, again, as you said, we were kind of worried about going in. Uh, yeah. Like, is this going to bog us down at all? Um, but I, I really feel like the galactic trading has, as you say, not been forced on us uh, by I, the AP. There's, there have been, you've been given a lot of options uh, connected to the story that give you build points, uh, which is, which is nice. I so. thoroughly enjoy it myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. About the only thing that I wish it would have done was give you sort of like a random generation table for uh, the the shipping gigs so like um just like okay what are we shipping from uh from who to who you know it, it would have been fun to just like okay roll a d i don't know 20 or something and get like okay so you're going to be uh shipping plushies of boxes or something like that I, I thought that's how it was. Yes, I, I hate to point this, uh, well, to contradict oh. you, Liz, but that is, in fact, I'm looking at the table right now, and it is, in fact, a D20 that you roll to determine cargo types. Now, <laughs> that said... I thought we were making these up as we went. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's part of it, yeah. But that said, it is more fun to pull the audience and be like, hey, audience, what are we shipping today? Oh, toy Dogecoes. All right, my, uh, you know, baby's first Dogeco. And, I know, tell a Ron... dude honorable combat. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yes. Okay, then it's a perfect AP, as clearly I have no other critiques. <laughs> that, of course, yes, uh, my thoughts exactly. So... Yeah. I, I also love that in this book, this this last book, where we were pretty much exclusively underwater, like that's a thing that doesn't always happen, which is fun. But they also at the very beginning are like, here are ways to make it so that it's okay with your players and they're not just totally hosed. Mm -hmm. You're not throwing them into the deep end. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> okay. No, uh, stay around. <laughs> Dad jokes are super allowed on Father's Day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there, including you, Tom. We recognize and, you as a faux pas. Center of mind. Uh, thank you. Thank oh, you. And for those of you who don't have the best relationship with your dads, take care of yourself and be gentle with yourself today. So. That's yeah, true. sorry. That was my my addendum. There it was a happy Father's Day to all deserving fathers out there. There we go. <laughs> so, all right. 
We got a bit of a late start today. I'll uh, I'll take the well. I'm not going to take the blame for this one. I was the cause of it because my power went out very very inconsiderately. I didn't uh, throw you under the bus. I just said a crew member, Tom. You didn't have to tell them it was you. This, no, listen, this Tom is perfectly. He's responsible for the power outage in his in his hometown. I mean, Absolutely. you live in a wizard house that doesn't necessarily always get along with technology. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, that's been uh, that. That was not something that was on the contract when I signed initially to uh, rent this house, but that's okay. Uh, so yes, the power is on. If I suddenly disappear, you know what happened, uh, and who knows when I'll come back. But we are now, prepared for such such an occasion should it happen. Always be prepared. Yep. So I will step in as DM. Yes, today's icebreaker question: the true ice, true icebreaker is who's your favorite relative and why? Uh, so we'll get an answer to that, as well as one cool thing you picked up at seventh level for the start of book four, rapid fire, starting with Catch. Um, well, Catch doesn't play favorites, but more importantly, he doesn't like any of his relatives. So um, yeah, probably uh, probably his uh, his Mima on his, on his um, uh, mom's side, she uh, she didn't just hate him right off the bat. So, <laughs> and uh, as far as level seven goes, uh, I mean, I got a feat, and and yeah, I guess miracle worker as uh, as mechanic. But I'm not excited about that. I'm excited about the the weapon. Miracle worker is my favorite class feat to always forget to use. It's it's fantastic to just have it there on standby and then just yeah let it watch the game with you. Yeah, yeah, it's Simon. It's a plus two to either AC or attack and damage rolls for a whole minute as a move action. You oh, wow. day. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it, oh, it's too seem, right out. Yeah, you never seem to like find. Yeah, I can't settle. I mean, you've been playing with me with Sisnathil, like my my armor mechanic. Have I ever said I activate Miracle Worker? Um, I didn't even know you had it. And we're like <laughs> almost level 10. <laughs> so, actually, I think we are level 10, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Because I've, anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, Miracle Worker. Are we basically three, asking the audience to help remind Leif that they have that? Well, they had to remind me to use my crunk and electrostatic harness, like as, as Ninden. I still remember that. <laughs> Just, um, I, I know it's there. Just let me let me have this. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, listen. You have my full support, my friend. So uh, that was not rapid fire. I, I will take the blame for that one. Nick, what, what's happening with Icebreaker? Favorite, uh, favorite relative and one cool thing you got at level seven. Sloan, or I'm Nick, I'm Jen Agnostic. I play Sloan, she, she is a she, her. Uh, Sloan uh, doesn't know anything about her actual relatives, um, but uh, obviously her favorite adopted relative is Auntie Nuna. I was gonna say if it wasn't Nuna, this is gonna be real awkward. It, it would be it would be a very strange turn of events. Yes. Um, to be fair, everyone else is dead, so they're they're not really in the running anymore. Not much competition. And yes. you haven't gotten to you haven't gotten to know all of your new family because you've been adopted into the Barrett Sinclair clan. Yes, I have. I have a whole, I have a whole other new adopted family. Oh, you know what? That means Sloan got the thing that she was after. She doesn't know it yet. She's gonna have a Zuko later. Um, oh. oh. Anyway, um, and at level seven, Sloan is a real operative now, guys. A real operative. Take it's less ten. than CR eight. It gets tricked. You'll never fail a trick attack again. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's long. If the CR is less than eight. Which, I mean, most of the time, at level seven, probably. Yep. Not that one. Eh. Anyway, uh, how about Simon Maria? Uh, I'm Simon, he, him. Uh, I'm playing Maria, they, them. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Except uh, for level seven, I picked up, uh, I was actually struggling on the feet for a while, and then I found a relatively new one called Effortless Aerobatics, um, which will allow me to fly upwards without... Uh, having to pay double movement, so just up 20 feet instead of 10 feet, which will bring me out of reach of medium creatures. Very nice. Um, a real gem of a feat, you might say. Yeah, what? How? Oh, in jam, I get it. Good joke, Tom. That's why Thanks. I, that's why Thanks, Simon. It's the premium content. Um, 
Yeah, as for uh, family, Mareath, like many adventurers, doesn't have a great relationship with their family. Um, I like to think that... So so memory is weird for a Spathonite colony, right? You can sort of think of it as like um, oral tradition <laughs> within the yeah. community. Um, and I like to... Th and, and I think they have very fond, perhaps like overly fond memories of their um, grand parent, the Senator. swarm that uh, the the swarm that the swarm that they split out of split out of. Um, oh. And they, they don't actually know much about them except them being uh, very smart and well respected and well liked and very influential somewhere. They're, they're not sure where. The, the legends differ. Um, ah, yes, like of they were a politician or a musician or something like that. Um, and they haven't really found them in part because they don't want to know how true the legends are. Oh, interesting. Cool. Uh, Liz, Auntie Nuna. Hi, uh, I'm Liz, she, her, and I'm playing Auntie Nuna, she, her. And I mean, obviously, uh, Auntie Nuna's favorite relative is Sloane. It's not like she'd go into a life of crime for anybody. I mean, <laughs> she she would, but like, she she wouldn't go happily. <laughs> <laughs> she would she wouldn't go back into a life yes. of crime. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She would have just retired. Yeah. Okay. Good. And one cool thing you got at level seven. Oh, uh, one cool thing that I got at level seven is um, it's time for an expertise talent. So I took analyst which is when using sense motive to detect deception or discern like a secret message she doesn't get false positives you won't think a truthful statement contains deceptions or infer false information unless you roll a one on the expertise die wow okay that's good to know please remind me of that when you're sensing people's motives i feel like that's the sort of thing you should add to your macro because otherwise you and tom are both gonna forget all right, can do. All right, and then last but certainly not least, I definitely didn't save him for last because <laughs> I knew that this would be a tough question for him. Jet playing Gus. Uh, well, I'm Jet and I play Gus and we're both he, him. And actually it wasn't that hard. Uh, his favorite family member, it's a little bit of a cheat because it's almost a duo. His older sister, Callie, and her wife, Sizzle. Uh, Callie was his mom was his mom her mo his mom was there when she could be, but she was working as a miner in the diaspora quite often for the Hard Scrabble co co Collective. So when she was there, she was very present, and he did love her and had a good relationship. But she wasn't there all the time, so Callie sort of was a pseudo mother figure growing up, which is Aww. interesting considering she's only like five years older than him. But oh, that's that's not that uncommon. And his younger brother was kind of a jet, kind of a flame head. So they're they're cool now, but growing up, <laughs> and then the twins. As as someone who who writes incredible amounts of backstory for their character, I really appreciate that this was not only easy. You had like a whole like two paragraphs to back it up. <laughs> Yeah, bravo. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh. and I mean, his dad, his dad, he did have a good relationship with his dad too. But his dad was working a lot at the docks. He had to support like five kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a cool thing at level seven. I now have a manifold array, which means I can manifest two aspects of my array simultaneously. But the second one is at four levels lower than my current maximum. Which means we're probably going to get to see some more of the cloud. Yeah, we pretty much only ever see the weapon, right? Currently, Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. The, the sheath cloud. I use a lot when we're not doing combat because it just boosts passively two of my skills. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 The nanosite's really cool for that. I, uh, I really look forward to seeing if and what they change about it. Uh, and I hope that they keep that manifold array uh, thing there because that's very very cool 
So, uh, here at the top of the episode, before I go into our recap, um, Liz had something that she wanted to share with everyone to uh, continue the memory of someone important. So, Liz. Yeah, so usually we don't um, talk about why we can't make a, a session, and um, that's totally fine. Sometimes we just need to take time or something comes up or whatever, but for me, the reason I wasn't here last week is because I lost a really good friend. Um, his name was Jesse Ham, and he was a comic book artist, but also a really talented essayist about art and about storytelling and how to do these things well. So if you're a, uh, and he left behind a big body of work. Um, if you are an aspiring story writer or comic book artist, and even if you're just, even if you just enjoy consuming these things, um, please Google Jesse Ham. That's H A M M. Uh, artist. <laughs> the uh, just Jesse Ham. H A M M is a is a porn actor, but my Jesse Ham. Uh, wrote a lot of um, really great essays and even just tweets. Uh, he had a whole tweet account and I guess I just wanted to share that because I feel like that way um, he's still around a bit. So that was it. Yeah. Yeah. People are, what's the quote? People are only gone as long as you don't remember them. Or something Plus, like that. he just had really good advice and was just a. He was one of those people who was really good at seeing what was important. Yeah. So. All right, let's get to game. Okay, let's get to game. Thank you, Liz. Yes, thank you for sharing. Yes. Uh, thank you. All right. Last week, our free flying traders witnessed and participated in a ritual that was not at all sexual in nature, but beautiful and moving. This won the trust of the Aglians, who showed the crew where to find a rare mineral that could disrupt the sensors on the Harvester, the company's machine, which was threatening the forest of the Aglians. The crew eventually arrived at the Harvester, but not before fighting a water elemental and being drawn in by the eldritch skeleton of a long dead behemoth on the bottom of the ocean floor. It was quite a journey. Uh, they quickly got to work shutting the harvester down, and luckily were able to get it nearly done by the time Avarin Sacrion, project man manager and literal dragon, arrived on the scene to try and stop them. The crew managed to win the day, but almost everyone came away with some level of injury. Some more than others. Uh, what comes to mind is Mareop getting chewed up by the machine <laughs> while trying to use the pink stone that y'all fought so hard for. What was and the exceeding one? What was so the machine did this more, time? The machine did more damage than like any monster will ever run into. Oh, no. What was great this time was Gus barely scratched this time. Everyone else <laughs> beat to flame. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a big open arena. Is the thing like typically uh, there's a way to channel everybody towards you, but. Not this time. So I'm, our PCs, I'm really glad that we're all twelve, and Tom now has to like specify every time he talks about his ceremony that it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> hey, Catch and Gus uh, were crying and holding each other. It was beautiful. And you're in character development from Maria. It was beautiful. Sexual, and that's the last we'll say of it. It could be beautiful and sexual. <laughs> you're not wrong. No. But listen, listen. I deal with. <laughs> 12 year olds at work. <laughs> you would have no idea how right you are. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, they informed the Aglians of their victory, then made it back to the Severance Package, there to hightail it off of this planet with Shan in tow, but not before having a farewell feast with their friends. And I think we can truly say now, friends, uh, the crew of the Wintermore. Yes. And that's about where we left off. So, you all are traveling through the drift. Oh, and I mean, of course, who could forget the uh, the defense of the severance package? Uh, your <laughs> three great. faithful goblins, uh, Flea Grebe, Rattlesnarp, and Goog, whose name and I definitely future. don't have a to think about. And future Goog, or Rattlesnarp. I think it's Rattlesnarp, one. isn't it? Rattlesnarp. 
I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. It was the holograms went off. Uh Anyway, so after that perfectly normal story, you all are traveling through the drift. Uh, What's everyone doing on these 1d6 divided by two days? In fact, why don't, uh, pilot, why don't you roll those pilot Sloan? The d6 divided by two. Etch mentions to Sloan, hey, hey, yo, you you know, you can take your time heading home this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I can just take 10 on anything I want now, uh, which gives us a 29. As long as you have two skills. Just a you gotta have, skill. Yeah, you got to have skill focus in the skill. Oh, you're and right. I do. And mine are not those. <laughs> what I mean. Smuggler. You could absolutely. Ultimate sense motive. No, I can't take my time on piloting. I will absolutely no, but you, you don't have to. Oh, see, that was a bad roll anyway, so you're fine. Um, so, oh well, but it's not the roll. It's listen. I'm gonna let you take as much time as you want. If you're in a hurry, we roll the die. But it's gonna take you a maximum of six days. How about that? Um, I don't know that I've ever, you know come across this in my time running Starfinder, a crew that wanted to take more time to get home. But... Take the scenic route through the drift. <laughs> we're we're we beat do, to yes. hell, you know, our gear's we, uh, trash. We see <laughs> some of those floating bits of, uh, you know, the plane of fire. Um, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the robot Medusa cascade, the uh, mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff. There's a bunch of beautiful... Yeah, there, you know, there's that, that river of kittens. We'll, yes. we'll cruise through yes. that river that, go, that that weaves through the diaspora. It's super cool. Oh my god, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. That is what made me fall in love with Starfinder. What book uh, is this in? Uh, it's in the core rule book. Uh, yeah, there's a river the through world. the diaspora. It's very cool. Oh, I just yeah. changed the, 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 the name the, the Cat River, the Nian Catazon. Yes. <laughs> uh, motion, motion passed. Executive decision. So I specifically requests to see this place, but is uh is anybody gonna try and build anything while we're while we're going to where we're going? Yeah, uh, augmentations. I would like us to deal with those in house if possible. Cool, cool. <laughs> uh, what are you saying that there might be a reason that we shouldn't trust third party party augmentations? No, perhaps, I just that perhaps we've had a bad experience with one in the past, in the it, recent it, past. It wasn't even that. It, Gus Gus uh, appreciates handmade things and likes to make things. It, do you not remember the personalized bobbleheads he made you all? Yes, Marais yes, was you know, so yeah. hard. <laughs> bobbleheads, needlepoint, deadly uh, bodily augmentations that you have to like scoop organs out to install. Just the homemade things. Yeah, just the homemade things. <laughs> Uh, Just so, crafting things. Yeah, Gus is probably going to take a day or two to to do some building, uh, and he'll probably need Morayoth's help at one point because uh, he's doing a you personal need augmentation. Mites. Yeah, personal augmentation, you know, and an ability crystal. And then at the end of that, he's going to go to catch. And he's going to be like, "I need your help. I'm pretty okay. good at this, but I don't think I should do surgery on myself." <laughs> I would say that's that, when you're like when you go to get into the tech shop initially, you'll actually find um, Goog standing guard there. And when you try to get in, he'll, he'll like hold his hand up and he'll say, "What's the password?" Uh, here's a pie. <laughs> that's not. That's not the. And he jumps up and grabs the pie and eats it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Lock out under official orders of Master Catch. <laughs> I I really need to build some things, <laughs> please. Well, I'm sorry. You're just and then at that at, like uh, Flea Reeb comes running down the hall with like an armful of like e- electronic components that looks like he may have ripped them out of the wall of the ship. Mm. And he he runs up to uh, to Goog and he says, uh, <clears throat> "Catch us them." And and Goog says, "Yep, that's the password." And the door slides open. <laughs> I didn't catch that. What was that. it you broke out there? Here, let me oh. <laughs> turn your volume down slightly. Um, Flea Grieve runs up with an armful of electronics that may have come out of the wall, and he says, um, and, and Goog says, password? And Flea Grieve's like, catch it is awesome! And Goog <laughs> just kind of, yep, that's the password, and opens the door. 
um, and lets him in. <laughs> and you Catch can see there, awesome. uh, r- Rattle Snarp and, uh, and Catch, like, huddled over the bench. Uh, Catch is awesome. <laughs> That's a password! And the door opens. Because <laughs> <laughs> we'll right. enter and right. go to a different bench. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, you're not so far. Ah, whatever. What, I know what the got? password. I'm part of the team. Social engineering. <laughs> uh, but and then, and then after completing all of the construction, um, he he is going to ask Catch's help uh, to install these augmentations. I'm gonna, um, not going to ask Catch what he's working on. Gus is in his own head. He's doing some things. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is okay. I just, I just wanted this to be. Uh, and, and the interesting thing you probably see is like Gus probably hooks up uh, something similar to a dialysis machine, dialysis machine to his, to like his prosthetic arm, and you see him like pulling nanites from his body and filling ampules and all sorts of stuff. Um, Catch is too busy working on his own thing to notice, but I'm sure once Flea Reeb dumps all of the electronics on the on the bench, he'll he'll probably like notice what you're doing and just be like staring wide eyed like. Oh, they're inside of me. <laughs> Mostly here. <laughs> A little bit up <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and then should we get to the surgery, uh, Catch will come in and Gus will be laying on the chair and he's got, there's a, there's a projector above him and it's displaying a grid across his entire body. Actually, no, Gus will be standing, holding on to two handles, and he's got you got two projectors projecting a grid on his front and his back, and he's basically just he's he's just gonna be naked again. And uh, <laughs> there's a table with just like tw- Gus with like twenty four <laughs> twenty four small syringes full of a uh, red metallic fluid, and then like a giant one, like something that you would inject a. Uh, a horse with like just an absolutely Horrible. massive syringe and just kind of like looking at him like different points on the grid are lit up in like a brighter like red color and he's like i need you to inject all of the little ones at the at those points and then the big one just right into my heart <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't gotta tell me twice <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and after the smaller injection, injections, there's going to be like a small spider web of glowing red orange energy. And his skin is actually going, his skin, not his fur, is going to turn red. And it's going to give his fur a little bit of a red undertone. Uh, and then the injection to the heart. Now we got to pay a an, Nicola again. Huh? <laughs> now we got to commission new art for you. Again? <laughs> Uh, when the horn broke off, I did a Photoshop edit for Gus. Uh, I'll figure out something for this. But so the, his skin has now is now r- like reddish red, and then the giant injection into the heart. He'll he'll probably like tense up and spasm a lot, and maybe foam at the mouth a little bit. Then he'll wipe that off, and he'll be fairly weak and just kind of sit down. Thanks, Catch. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Catch, uh, while he's injecting you, uh, wants to ask, what? so what is, what is all of this? Um, I figured out a way to sort of accelerate the spread of my nanites and sort of direct their purpose. Uh, the ones that you embedded into my dermis, uh, they ex- rapidly accelerate my ability to heal injuries. And the one you injected into my heart also allows me to rapidly recover from injuries, but it they interact interestingly together. It's it just makes me makes it harder to kill me. <laughs> Catch may or may not have only injected you twenty three times. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Nanites, you say, huh? <laughs> oh boy. Well, that's a, that's a thirty three to, to lift a vial of of your nanites. Oh, and no. now catch multi classes. Nanocyte. <laughs> Nana. Maybe. No. What, so I have to ask Jet, what are the candles for? You said he was holding two candles? Uh, I, I, 
I, I might have just misspoke handles. or got misunderstood. Handles, like two handles, like he was using it to hold himself up. Yes. No, that like makes a weird occult ritual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it was not. <laughs> or, you know. That's if you were playing a witch. Weird um, chanting in the background coming from no audible, like their discernible source. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess when we're done with that scene, uh, I guess I'm not sure if this is a whole scene, but Marath does want to like get in touch with the Zeno wardens. I guess we can't do that uh, about the um a good a gap a gaff not a gathians aglians uh, like aglians. like algae but you put the g in front of yeah it. yeah uh, aglians um oh. but I guess since we're in the drift we can't do this so they'll probably spend a lot of the trip sort of writing up an essay to send to like sort of summarize why they should be accepted and um you, Maria you can com- is not experienced what was that you can communicate in the drift because that's how interstellar tra- messages tra- yeah get yeah. from yeah, system to system they're at the same rate right yeah it'll, thought- it might it might actually arrive later than you get there uh yeah. depending because it's got a role uh assuming you're sending it to the Oh, I had the name of the, well, the plant ship. Yeah, again, I think it makes sense to you, right? We're going to Absalom Station. Presumably the Xeno Wardens have a, have a um, branch office there. Their, their flagship is, in fact, in orbit around uh, Absalom Station, I want to say. Yeah, so Marioth is just trying to put together the, the report that conversations can be launched off of. Um, and maybe they get wording advice from Sloan and, and Auntie Nuna. Yeah. Can, yeah. We can copy edit that for you, dear. Shan will probably work pretty closely with you, uh, Maria. Oh, yeah, Shan as, exists. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she does exist. I, you know, mm. you all are more interesting uh, to me than, you know, NPCs in general. So I might have forgotten to occasionally, you know, have her chime in on things. But this is something that she's absolutely, she's very passionate about. Uh, and so she will work with you. Uh, you two can often be found, uh, I don't know, on the ship, um, maybe in the the galley or something like that, just sort of seriously working on this. Working through the, yeah, working through the phrasing, how to like, uh, the, the drawing the comparison between Spathanae and Aglions as a case against Edge Corp's operation. Yeah. Yeah, and Shan will point out just the the blatant like disregard like they knew they know the aglians are a thing and uh they ignored it anyway so she'll uh very heatedly sort of she's probably responsible for a lot of heated language that makes it into the the copy and then you sort of tone it down a little bit maybe and uh make it make it less uh maybe a little mariah is not that even keeled. No, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Now both of you are a little hot-headed. Uh, so, yeah. But that's good. Uh, she will, she will thank you uh, and say, "Well, Marioth, I, uh, I never knew that I'd find somebody else that was like the Aglians. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't very familiar with your species before. Uh, before. Oh, yes, there are not very many of us. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah." But in a way, it is not, we are not that odd. You you have lots of cells. They are very stupid, just like our constituents are very stupid. And then you put them together and you get something that is smart. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, looking at the Aglians and seeing how they work and then seeing you and how you work, it's it's hard to argue that it doesn't work. So... It was interesting that their um, swarms were more flexible than Spathine. We, uh, they created ad hoc groups based off of the feelings of the community as a whole. And we uh, are more nationalistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting. They seemed to be able to just sort of the, the concept of the component, uh, the constituents, if you will, uh, sort of formed the mind of the swarm, the collective. But, yes, yes, that is how it works. Yeah, and you two will, you know, you can you can geek out about that and make these uh, draw these comparisons using the Spathanes 
recognized sapience as a uh, as a building block. But yeah, uh, it is. This is looking very bad for the company. Like in terms of uh, they they don't they don't stand a very good chance once this is brought to the Xeno Wardens' notice. Of the Xeno Wardens just sort of shrugging this off. The Xeno Wardens are gonna want to litigation. They are not very chill. No, they have zero chill when it comes to the environment. This will be tied up in the courts for years. <laughs> I mean, they're like Greenpeace, but with an army. Like, that is yeah. not going to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yep. That's, a th- that. that is going to be that for the Aglians. Yes, drunk fan ninja, litigate and chill. That is <laughs> that is what they like to do on a Friday night. So, uh, let's see, let's see. Catch, what was Catch working on in that workshop? Are we gonna are we gonna hear about it or are you gonna keep uh, us in suspense? Oh yeah, no, you'll you'll definitely hear about it. Um, towards the towards the end of the uh, the 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 journey, though, I want to leave room in case anybody had anything else. Well, I got a, I got a thing that happens. But do you also want to be at the end of the journey? Um, I don't think so. I think it's fine to interject, uh, just sort of insert myself into your the the narrative that you all are weaving. These drift travels are great. I just sort of sit back and like <laughs> let you all talk, and it's nice. So Rip uh, ap- appears in reality and. Tom steps through into the ship. Yeah, this, this tall, skinny human guy, this human nerd with glasses, steps through a portal and says, "Well, um, strange. I didn't expect any spaceborn humans to be here." <laughs> um. So, catch these last few days. Uh, seeing Shan has sort of dredged up some more, some more memories from your past because, as we we have implied, you and Shan have known each other for some time now you have a history so she's been relatively friendly with you uh, but your mind is brought back to when you woke up in the hospital after the crash after the incident after the race so uh, this can happen uh, wherever you would uh, you would prefer this memory to sort of resurface but catch you find yourself in the hospital a cast around your one hand and uh, bandages covering much more of your body, along with handcuffs around both hands. Uh, you have just enough slack to maneuver into a sitting position as you are chained to a bed that can be adjusted to have an incline or not. So, you know, your typical hospital bed. So, we left you as you began to call out to the impassive security, uh, station security officers sort of standing to either side of your door, which is not a good sign. Uh, eventually, as I imagine Catch probably doesn't give up so easily, uh, the best he can get out of them is that you are being held here pending investigation into the incident last night. You may not leave. And he, you know, gestures to your handcuffs. So I'll just kind of like lie back in a huff, <clears throat> frustrated. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, you hear a voice uh, coming from outside the door. Uh, You recognize that voice. It is, in fact, Shan. Her voice gets closer and closer, and eventually you hear her right outside your door talking with who is probably another officer. Uh, The door to your room opens, and she strides into the room. She walks directly over to you and slaps you right across the face. Both of the security officers uh, put up a fuss and start crossing the room, but she puts her hands up and says, no, sorry, no, no, I'm done. I'll, sorry, I'll, she, you know, stammers and uh, she then pulls a chair from the side of the room as the officers sort of look at each other, then at her, back at each other, then go back to their posts by the door. Shan sort of, you know, looks at you for a while. What did you do, you idiot? What? What happened? Then she, uh, you know, looks at the officers. Etch is just kind of, like, speechless. He doesn't really know what to say. He's just, and all that, like, really, because he's, he's like, he's been, he's, like, basically been stunned by 
this kind of outburst that was totally unexpected. Um, yeah. Uh, the like the best he can get out is just uh uh what the race catch I do you remember I didn't do I didn't do nothing it was just a it was just a race I heard you were there I she you know looks again at the the two security officers in the room and I, 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 I shouldn't have come. This was a mistake. I don't know what. Uh, obviously, they were going to have officers around here. I, I, she, uh, she gets up to go, and uh, you know, sort That's of. just kind of like, babe, wait. Uh, she is going to look over her shoulder and say, "Dell was like a brother to me, catch." And. Uh, She's going to slide the chair, you know, with her foot over into the wall and uh, start walking towards the door. The officer will open the door. And she walks away. We fade from that scene to another of Ketch's. We see a courtroom. Ketch sits at a bench with his public defendant, a kobold in a nice suit. They both face a very serious Sheeran in black robes, sitting on a platform. The court proceedings go by in a blur. Folks from, from the area surrounding the race uh, that were affected by the fire are brought in. First responders testify to the severity of the damages caused, as well as the coroner who was responsible for the autopsy on Dell, your friend, who died in the crash. In particular, uh, one security officer comes up to the stand and delivers a damning testimony against you. He brings out forensics reports on the engine of Dell's hover car and how exactly it was engineered to have a catastrophic failure. What's worse, he presents an anonymous testimonial from someone claiming to be on your crew, swearing that you were seen working on Dell's car the day of the race. Ultimately, you are sentenced to 10 years in prison, prison with the chance for parole for your involvement in the events that night. We fade out on Ketch's face as his sentence is read. Being uh, Catch in a bad suit, just like crammed into, you know, a stiff shirt and tie to try and look presentable, and it's not working. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Or what is Ketch's sort of demeanor or attitude during the trial? Oh, he's he's just like defeated. He 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 rarely looks up, and like the only time that he's really testifying, he just kind of like mumbles something about the the burns on his hands. Oh. Man. Ah, oh, I hate doing this to Ketch. I really do. Uh, you know, one day I'll make a, a character who's not tragic, but <laughs> it is not this day. Day is not that day. <laughs> this day we cry. I be I'll believe it when I see it, Leif. <laughs> <laughs> you write what you know, right? Ah. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, catch in in lighter news in present day catch because. You know, this does have some semblance of a happy ending. He gets out of prison, otherwise he wouldn't be here right now. What's Ketch working on in the workshop, Jet? Leif? Oh, That's gosh. Well, um, yeah, ready for a little bit of a lighter lighter one here? Let's go. Um, so uh, probably like the last day of um, of Drift Travel, we're all, uh, or you're you're all having a nice communal dinner. Uh, catch absent again for like the, the fifth time in a row. Um, when, when all of a sudden, when you're like halfway through the meal, he'll actually come in and he's just like grinning like a friggin' idiot. Um, and he's got, he's got like one hand behind his back and he's just kind of like walks in. He's like, hey, hey guys, you want to see something? Catch, your mouth is in a shape that indicates pleasure. <laughs> Why? Check this out. And he whips out. It looks bizarre, but like just kind of in like a way that it's just not 
it, it just doesn't look like a normal weapon. It looks like um, basically a bionic hand. Um, and that's the, that's the glamour fusion uh, <laughs> look of it. And he'll, he'll be like, check this out. And he kind of waves his hand over it. And the, um, and the like fingers kind of fuse together and it forms into like this big, like cylinder type cannon with like rotating, uh, like concentric circles going down the, uh, the barrel. And it like starts like glowing, like thrumming with, uh, with, uh, electromagnetic energy um, and like maybe one of the spoons on the counter kind of flies over and sticks to it and he's like oh yeah and he adjusts it a little bit and the spoon falls off Gus's like, arm Tink. Oh. <laughs> yeah. oh no 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 <laughs> adjusts it again and it drops the arm too he's like oh okay no here I got it I got it check this out this is my new baby <clears throat> is its name new baby you already have an arm catch. Do you need? Yeah, to? but this one, this one does some serious damage. Uh, he starts getting into like the super technical bits of it. But the like, what you guys can like glean from it is that miniaturized railgun uh, technology accelerates a star metal slug to um, such great speeds that it sublimates on contact, um, causing terrible burns, especially on critical hits. Um, and it's loaded with enough of the metal that the batteries are really the only component that requires changing and uh, in combat. You might have to change out the metal every like week or so of use, but that's that's beside the point. Um, <clears throat> and he's just like, what what is this gun? Uh, it's a it's a home brew. Catch built it. It's, I'm a pro. I mean, I can't Oh, well, I mean, if you really must know, the the base weapon that I built it from is actually a agitator, uh, a blaze agitator. It's an energy weapon. Mm, nice. I've just given it a flavor. It, like it does flavor. actually target EAC. Um, well, love that flavor. Yes. That's awesome and, catch. And he's like, and check it out. So it's like. He's like, it's one handed and he's like waving it around and stuff. And he like kind of like shakes it a little bit and like out, out the side pops the uh, a bipod and he like grabs onto. He's like, and you can use this as a grip and you, or you can like sw shift it down and use it as just like a stand. And it's got a it's got a 4X scope on it with a laser sight. And oh, and check this out. And I actually need everybody to roll me a reflex save. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Suppose. <laughs> This is the reason that Sloane is now has uncanny agility. Yeah, no, you're all you're all fine except for Gus who who critically failed. As um, there's a there's a flash of light in a 15 foot cone in front of the uh, the gun. It's like it's got a it's got a um, oh, what are they even called? Um, they're like fire. Oh, I'm, fire burst chamber. It's go. my my own little design and like. Then he realizes that it like went off. He's like, "Oh, oh no!" <laughs> like adjust it, and Gus, you're gonna be blinded for. Uh, uh, only one, only about six seconds. I like the yeah. idea that my nanites acted to protect my eyes, and they just formed a red shell over them. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh. everything went dark. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a Mark One flash grenade loaded into there. Um, but yeah, um, f fire burst chamber, a new, a new fun thing out of, uh, out of the gem, uh, allows you to load it with a grenade and, and fire that grenade in a 15 foot cone in front of you. So, uh, on it. oh man, Love it. just, yeah, that doesn't make grenades good though. No, nope, mm. it doesn't, but Hey, <laughs> now I don't have to draw them. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. It's, it's like having a grenade them. launcher. But yeah, in a in a cone, which is pretty cool. Like I really like it. For grenades are fun for one-off things. It also it also doesn't take up a weapon slot. It's on the barrel, so uh, so that was nice. Sweet. And I do enjoy just thinking of Ketch like hauling this thing around the battlefield. This improbably large weapon. Boom. One-handed. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So. As you get closer to Absalom Station, 
Uh, Shan will inform you all that she will be traveling to the Absalom headquarters of the Xena Wardens there to make her case for the organization to intercede on behalf of Entha and the Aglians. She'll, uh, you know, give special thanks to uh, Moraoth for helping develop this uh, quasi-thesis on uh, the Aglians in, you know, a six-day thesis. But still. Is this something that Moraoth can go to, or will it take too long? It'll probably take too long. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be weeks of her sort of standing in front of them and meeting with different people and making appointments and stuff. Maria could make some appointments, uh, you know, or, or maybe like be there for the for the initial presentation, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You you all will have some uh, some downtime here. Um, so. Tarika, uh, oh, well, Shan will assure you all that she will go back to see her ma before she uh, goes off gallivanting and doing any more nature activism or such things. Uh, Tarika will reach out to you all once you arrive at Absalom Station and tell you she'll swing by the severance package around dinner time. Uh, as you all are arriving, it is about eight hours from uh, packed standard time, you know, like Absalom Station time. You're about eight hours from dinner. Uh, she wants to spend some time with Shan first. Uh, this gives you a convenient chunk of time to get some shopping done, uh, preliminarily. Uh, does anybody buy anything fun? Uh, Auntie Nuna bought and had installed a Mark II ability crystal, so now she's super, super smart. So smart. So smart. Oh, like did you end up putting it in your, your int or your wisdom? Um, so she moved her Mark I ability crystal to Wisdom, and then uh, this goes to Intelligence. Gotcha. Cool, cool, cool. Very neat. Ain't gonna get nothing past down to Nuna now. Marioth, you crazy money spender, you. You buying anything fun? Only boring things, I'm afraid. Uh, the deflective reinforcement and thermal capacitor. Ah, uh, going in for them resistances. Yeah. Getting almost getting chewed up by a giant, you know, harvester. Uh, put the fear of put the fear of slashing damage into Maria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, excellent. Cool. Gus bought a whole bunch of food and groceries. He's gonna cook. He sends out a he sends out an evite to everyone on the crew to, to a formal dining experience tonight, as well as to Tarika and possibly Shan if Shan's gonna show up. And also buys a hundred feet of cable. Just titanium cable and a battery. Is that part of the the, the dinner? No, yeah, that's just. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I like that combination there, Jet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turns out right. that uh, Jet that uh, Gus has rigged up a, a table on like a platform suspended by wires, and we're to to dine with a view. Uh, unfortunately, Auntie not that exciting. <laughs> Auntie Nuna takes one look at the engineering and is like, nope. Gus is a good engineer. Oh, I'm sorry. Dear. He's just not catch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, catch got his brain upgraded. Ooh, getting that data jack. Yeah. Catch catch goes into his wallet and pulls out that dusty old um, augmentation uh, discount card from <laughs> book two, and is going to go redeem that. <laughs> it's like a punch card. Yep. Like, yeah, it's a punch <laughs> card. And then you get a free yogurt. Uh, Twenty, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, augmentation shop and the yogurt shop across the across the road have this deal going, where you know you buy ten augmentations, you get one free yogurt. You buy twenty free, yo you know, you buy twenty yogurts, you get one free augmentation. It's, it's a good deal. Really good deal. Actually, that, that's, something of import. That's... Gus bought a Starfinder backpack. <laughs> that is oh, nice. Love those. Oh man, now I want frozen yogurt. Sorry. Um, uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. We don't have any good places around here. I could DoorDash Baskin Robbins. It's not frozen yogurt. It's ice cream. And they will bring it to me. Not that is what DoorDash does. <laughs> or just drive there after and save like $10. Bah. That's future Nick's problem. Cavalier so. DoorDashing. Just, just remember, you're paying for the you convenience. You know, you know, you you helped me get this job that pays too much money. Yeah, but you gotta save mm -hmm. all of it aggressively. Says who? 
push all of your money into a pile like a dragon. No. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, calm down. <laughs> all right. So, uh, no saving of money in game, in the game that we're playing called Starfinder. Uh, no, no bought better no. armor. I offered these nerds since I got a really nice gun um, to give them some of my money, but nobody took me up on it, so I bought better armor. Well, after yeah, I said I'd take you up on that, I realized that I, in fact, actually had a higher uh, projected wealth than you, so I felt bad taking it, taking that. That's That's fair. Y'all are very oh. kind to each other. Yes. Well, we are. Yeah. <laughs> we try. As players, yes. <laughs> no. So, uh, eight eight hours will pass, and uh, Shan is off uh, reuniting with other people that she knows on Absalom Station. She will not be joining, although she does graciously thank Gus for the invite, the evite. Uh, have a good day, Drunk Fan Ninja. And Bye, Ninja. Yes. So, Tariq will show up at the door. Everybody will be there. Um, and Gus, why don't you tell us uh, what you've cooked up? I'll, I'll let you all know. I told Jet, hey, you know, Gus is going to have a chance to make dinner for everybody. I wanted to warn you just in case you mm -hmm. wanted to think of something. He sends me like a four course, five course meal. He's like, all right, I'm ready. <laughs> like a Redwood style, uh, Red Wall style <laughs> feast. So uh. with my chef's tools that my arm morphs into, I got a 22 on this profession cook check. Our starter for the evening is a simple tomato soup. Uh, you know, nothing super complex about it. Just, just delicious and seasoned appropriately. Our main is a quinoa mushroom risotto with mm. tomato bruschetta on the side and a simple salad. Uh, the salad contains some, it's like a corn salad with arugula, sun-dried tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, cucumber, and roasted pine nuts. Uh, we also have a cheese board. Uh, all dairy products have been, sub uh, Eoxian black milk has been substituted in for all the dairy products because Gus does not eat cow-based dairy. Uh, the cheese board also has some dried, what's that? What about the poor spiders, Gus? They didn't ask for this either. That's fine. <laughs> He doesn't want it. It's a little. It's a little too close to home. Uh, but uh, the cheese board also has some dried figs and some small little bits of toast. And the dessert is a a black a black bean brownie with a scoop of uh, Eoxian black milk based ice cream with a trio of yogurt dipped uh, black milk spider eggs arranged artfully on top with like a little little leaf. <laughs> I'm so upset right now. Tasteful. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gus, I made it. Gus presents it all in his like full chef's attire with the big hat. <laughs> Fantastic. It makes me realize that um, black milk is probably not the most disturbing thing in the galaxy. Because no? if Gus is disturbed by cow's milk, this implies that somewhere someone's using monkey milk and we would be appalled as <laughs> humanoid people. Hmm. Maybe I guess little. I always assumed that at this point, all uh, animal type products are just made in vats. I yeah. think, yes, all food you get is pretty much made in vats in the Starfinder universe. Um, Probably. Yeah. But Gus, if, Unless if, you pay a lot, a lot of money for it. Yeah. Gu Gus opts for the black milk variant of his dairy products rather than the actually, cow based variant. <laughs> Yeah, the, well, I was going to say, so actually the black milk being made from, like, actual biological spiders is probably quite expensive. Yeah. Yeah, well, fancy. But, like, there's probably some humanoid spider race out there, right, that's horribly offended by, like, farming spiders for their milk. Exactly. I bet that the drow are not big fans. Oh, <sighs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They take it very personally if you serve it to them, which is honestly... Not a bug, but a feature. Yeah, well, like, you could still synthesize animal products in a vat without involving an actual animal, right? Like, meat is technically an animal product, but if you grow it in a vat, like, it's not as offensive. So similarly, your black milk, even though it originally came from spiders, can still be vat-grown, right? Except for the actual spider eggs that I put on top. I did a trio of spider eggs dipped in yogurt. But those could also be vat grown in theory. Sure. Could be. But I think Gus went all fancy. Yeah, wow. I did go very fancy. 
Yes. I probably, I probably, <laughs> Gus probably made the ice cream. No expense was spared. <laughs> but is, at that point, is it like, in Starfinder, is that sort of a moral issue, right? In the same way that like, we are getting increasingly uh, uncomfortable with uh, animal products. Well, like, we get to a point in Starfinder where instead of a cost issue, it's a moral issue. Mm. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, with, with the means to avoid it. Yeah. yeah. But. I mean, the right, moral issue isn't. Uh, I mean, in Starfinder, the moral issue is like, uh, there are sentient cows. <laughs> sure, but let's if they're sentient spiders, right? We Which have not had any yet. published yet. We've had sentient bugs, but I don't think any actual spiders. We have had sentient bugs, but are the sentient bugs of, uh, morally offended by us eating the non-sentient bugs? Spath and I are not grossed out at all. I'm just saying, like, yeah, in... <laughs> I yeah. did not mean to cause this debate. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of the sorts of things that we end up being grossed out by eating are the things that are similar to us. Oh, right? Han are apparently sacred I mean, spiders. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, they are. Well, I mean, anyways, the thing we've thus so far been the most grossed out by is uh, black milk, <laughs> spider eggs. Milk. But to be fair, if Gus were cooking for a Han, he would not use. He would not give them spider products. <laughs> Well, I think what's gross about black milk is not that it comes from spiders, but that it's milk and black. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been a fun ride. Anyway, anyway, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> rest control of, of the ship once more because I've tried three times and I'm sorry, Tom. Very, I'm, very, I'm very super sorry. sorry. I didn't mean no, to. No, 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 no. This is yeah. Y'all are my friends and I love you all, but uh, <laughs> there just comes a time when you have to say enough talk of black milk, uh, even if Patrick is in the in the chat. So. Begging us to add. Yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed this foray into why Black yeah. is gross. So, uh, Tarika will, you know, uh, this this whole meal goes on, and the show of it is uh, extravagant and wonderful, and everybody has a good time. Uh, this is your first time sitting down to a, a fancy meal like this since, you know, this is your first time in civilization for at least a week or two. So. You've been on a backwater planet. Granted, all the happenings on that backwater planet took a day, but been a while. What so, a day it was. And what a day it was. It was a day that took a whole book. That was 45 pages of day. Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, Tarika will, you know, sort of sit back in her chair and dab at her face with the, at her, at her little otter whiskers, uh, Bernary whiskers <laughs> with her napkin and say, uh, Man, is it good to see you folks. I, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate y'all helping Shan out. That girl barely stuck around for two hours before she ran off to find the Xena Wardens and tell them all about what's going on over on Antha. A glint, uh, you know, hits her eye and she smiles with pride as she says, that girl's going to achieve whatever she wants to. I always said it. I always did. Now, I have two things to talk to you uh, about tonight. First up, I think you might want to consider hiring on some helping hands. Uh, you've done pretty well for yourself so far, but I'm starting to think with your savvy and my connections, we could start a shipping business. I get another crew, build another ship, have them take jobs that you don't have the time to do, pay them a cut, and anything after that is straight profits. Now, we're not going to turn into Evgenia Jameson Corporation here, but, you know, we can start, we can start something. What do y'all say? I think I know a guy. <laughs> All right. I think I met a guy on Akaton who would be perfect. Well, well, good. He uh, lived good. in that weird magic swamp thing. <laughs> I don't know if I'm familiar. Did he say something to the effect of pants are an illusion and so is death? No, he wore a lot of coveralls. No shirts, <laughs> just coveralls. Bibs? No, bibs. They're called coveralls. <laughs> I was overalls. using the wrong term. He wears a lot of bibs with no shirts. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It just makes me think of an oversized baby. <laughs> <laughs> He's about the size of a baby. He's Raxolite. <laughs> All right. Well, I do love Raxolites. Um, <laughs> hey baby, what are you wearing? Nothing but a bib. 
Not that I'll kind be of right bad. over. <laughs> um, Tarika will uh, take all this in and say, "What? Well, tell you what, you give me their uh, their contact information, and I'll scrounge up some more resumes and stuff, and I'll send them over to uh, you, uh, you, you Sloan. Uh, see if they meet your criteria. You're the sort of the one who put this crew together. So, uh, uh, worst that you can say is no. We don't want to do it, but." Um, yeah, you got a lot of assets, so I'll start throwing some stuff together and uh, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. How about that? Never hurts to generate some passive income. That's what I'm saying. So, number two, the job. Back when y'all liberated the good old severance package from the clutches of Aline Rasora and the company, there was a data package that I found on the computer systems. Took me a while to crack it, but it contains some mighty interesting information. She uh, she pauses, fiddling with the wrench at her belt uh, before continuing. It's big, real big. Seems the uh, the severance package was built to replace the windfalls, the uh, gold commerce barges the company builds for the Calistocracy on the Horseye orbital plate. You probably saw one on your way in. Those things, you did. Uh, this is Tom speaking. Uh, those things have a reputation for being loaded with serious treasure. We're talking retire to your own private moon kind of money. Uh, now, the Calistocracy does its best to keep the route secret, but piracy's gone up recently, which was the whole reason the company started working on an alternative, uh, the severance package. Well, we don't have any pirate warships sitting around, uh, unless she, you know, looks around. Unless. Unless. Shifty eyes. So she looks at Auntie Nuna for a second and then kind of. This, this could be arranged. <laughs> well, you know, don't don't you know go out of your way, because uh, we do have the security data contained in this module. Uh, with that, an enterprise and individual such as myself could create credentials for a small team of like-minded folk such as y'all, who could slip onto the ship, redirect its course to somewhere isolated, and uh, liberate the treasures on board. So, Liberate! I like where your head's at, Tariqa. Resist, right, guess? <laughs> Resist! <laughs> oh, I'd like to point out that Gus's chef's outfit, the mechanical arm fully on display. He's no sleeve on that side. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, y'all up for the heist of the century, then? We are always pleased. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. I mean, always... drunk, yeah, we are. We are always pleased to liberate assets from Edgecore. Excellent, excellent. So, you've got some time before the windfall sets off, uh, according to the information I got off the orbital plate systems. I'll keep an eye on their feed, their comings and goings, and let you know uh, when you need to get over there. So, feel free to take care of any other business you got in that time. Maybe do a few smaller jobs while you're waiting. I know you, Sloan. She, uh, she says with a wink. So, always hustling. Always on that grind. Uh, but oh, after this job, maybe we won't need to be. So, uh, do you have any questions about the job before I send you off? Do we know anything about this load in particular? Or do they ship all this treasure with regularity? All I know is that the ship is supposed to be loaded up with... Uh, this is... this. These are the ships that they load with treasure, so... Should Classic, like, it. Spanish treasure galleons, right? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What, what are our aliases? Like, who are we supposed to be? Do we need to buy new clothes? As far as I know, all you're going to have to do is sneak on board this ship, take control of the ship, and fly it off somewhere. So the only people you're going to have to interact with are the, uh, the ship's crew. <sighs> what do we know about the crew? And where is this cargo coming from and supposed to be going to? Well, windfalls are mostly automated. A skeleton crew can operate one. Uh, you're probably looking at a team of four mercenaries. Um, unfortunately, we can't just replace them. Uh, so that'd set off too many alarm bells. But it's a big ship for four people, so you all should be able to hide out until you can hijack it. So, you know, once it gets far enough away from the horse eye orbital plate, that kind of thing. Um, as for where it's going, I don't know. Doesn't really matter much, does it? Because it isn't getting there. That's the, she raises her glass. That's the idea. 
<laughs> we get I was it. just about to say that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it seems like foreign mercenaries is a very small crew to protect a large amount of wealth. Is that why doesn't this ha- why don't these ha- heists happen all of the time? Not everybody's fortunate enough to liberate a prototype starship from the company with all of the security information and whatnot. To you have we have the keys to the castle right now with this uh, this data module that I managed to crack. That's why it's it's taken me this long. So the crew uh, doesn't typically need to interact with anybody. They're just they're just there to make sure the ship stays on course. Um, but again, going back to what I was saying, this is why the company built the uh, the what they called the Oliphant, right? The uh, they took a small sledgehammer class, made it surreptitious and and small in size because nobody would expect it to have to be bigger on the inside. So <laughs> that is the reason this does happen pretty frequently. But they won't be expecting it to happen this way. I see. Is the ship well armed? Well, I mean, it's a it's a barge. It's got some guns on it, from what I understand. I I, I feel like we are still confused. Then uh, our security modules will let us board the ship with ease, but aren't these ships regularly just attacked? You don't need a security module for that. Right, but we would need a warship to attack it. Ah, on. yes. You need a bigger ship. Yeah, this is this is a like a large sized ship. Uh, yeah, so... Okay. It, the the more, speaking on board? More firepower than you have on the Oliphant. Uh, okay. The yeah. package. Yeah, it'd be like a transport attacking a frigate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're bringing, like, a little boat up alongside a big boat and then sneaking on board. Oh, no. So here's the plan. You're gonna... Uh, you're gonna take a transport over to the Horse Eye Orbital Plate, uh, like you did back in Book 1. Uh, and then you're gonna sneak on board this ship hide out until they take off, and then, uh, you know, incapacitate the crew. So we are not even using our ship. Just the data that we found on it. Correct. Right. Yeah. No, then uh, I'll... Because imagine if you took uh, the the severance package back to the horse eye orbital plate. Uh, you'd, you'd get recognized real quick. So uh, yeah. you take a passenger ship there like you did before. And I'll take the severance package to the ast- to an asteroid in the diaspora and wait for you with a bottle of champagne and celery. Maybe we could leave some instructions and you could get some upgrades done to the severance package while we're away. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, like I said, you've got some time before uh, the, the ship isn't there yet. So I'm going to monitor their feeds to make sure that y'all don't arrive too soon. Uh, so what you're so- saying is we could do some transport jobs while we're waiting. That was my thinking. Nice. You got anything on the radar, Tarika? Oh, I could probably uh, come up with something. Um, uh, Audience? Yeah. I mean, mechanically speaking, we'll probably do the find buyer. Uh, yeah, I was just for flavor but, wise, you know, that's yes, Tarika's yeah. job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I got a few. I got a few leads. Uh, let's see what you can. Let, let's see what we've got to work with. So, we'll. What would you like me to roll? Uh, let's give me the find buyer. Well, this will will fade out. This will happen tomorrow morning because it takes a whole day to to find a job. Okay. Um, so, find buyer. No, find cargo. Give me. Can I assume that everybody is sort of helping out with this to give that plus one to this roll? All right, cool. Give me that profession smuggler check to find a lot of cargo. Oh, you got it. Uh, I'll keep that 31. I should say so. Plus four, that is a 35. Uh, The DC for the plus one and a half times your character level, you're level seven, so DC is 20. Uh, You have exceeded the DC by 15. So... Oh, gosh, it's been so long since we did this that I can't remember how many lots of cargo your ship can hold. Rika so, is great at this. A hundred tons. This is the best I can lead. A yeah. hundred tons and a lot of cargo 
if I remember correctly, is 50 tons? Yeah, I think we can take four lots, if I recall. Yeah, that sounds right. I think it's four. Okay. Go ahead and roll me a d4 then, and let's see. Let's see what you got. And you folks in chat, if you would like to give me suggestions on what our free-flying traders are going to be free-flying and trading today, uh, go ahead and throw some suggestions out in chat for me. I got a one. So the good news is, because you exceeded it by 15, you can, for every five by which you exceed the DC, you can increase or decrease that die. So no, we'll just <laughs> increase it to the max we can carry. Yeah. 16 uh, tons. Uh, you carry, I think you can carry a hundred tons. We'll pay it's, my it's a hundred tons because oh. they're 25 ton cargo holds, but double because of the, their cargo holds of holding. I was more making a joke yeah. about the Tennessee Williams song. Oh, I totally missed that. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, got it. Yeah. I got you, Liz. All right. Oh, each massing 25 tons. Yes. So you can in fact carry, uh, four lots. So, uh, <laughs> we've got suggestions of farming video games, because farms don't exist anymore. Uh, Morkite Ore from Shades. Uh, oh, the <laughs> farming games were from Ghost, thank you. Uh, and then Patrick has suggested Meat Cubes, lab-grown and organic since the incident in 312 AG. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll say... Uh, one, two is ghost, three, four is legally distinct Morkite ore, and five, six is meat cubes. <laughs> All right, I got a four, so it's legally distinct Morkite ore. Uh, Less kite ore. We'll call it porkite. Yes. Porkite, <laughs> yes. Yes. Lion slides war stolen from evil bugs. Yes, yeah. No, this is evil. We're gonna flip the. We're gonna flip the script. It's they're actually gonna be evil bugs, and not. It's not gonna be like a colonialism, imperialism uh -huh. kind of narrative. Anyway. We have dwarves going into swarm territory mm. um, and fighting the swarm and bringing back poor kite or See, this is perfect. We don't even need an AP. We'll just sit here and like bullfleam the entire time. because I mean, if you want to write it, Tom. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, the, uh, the swarm leave, uh, leave behind some uh, metals and whatnot refined accident as a side a byproduct of their uh you know desiccating the worlds it's, that they occupy it's like bug ambergris Ooh. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, might so get I, got, this. I don't like it got it. We're, we're, we're getting back into our the the campaign we almost ran uh oh. alongside attack of the swarm <laughs> yeah <laughs> you've got all of this and you're going to be going to a world in near space uh, so, because I just rolled a d10, uh, and I got a 7, which sends you to a world in near space. So you come across this, uh, pulling out my, I'm just uh, getting all the cool stuff. You come across this Izzelgun, Izzelgun? How, how do you pronounce that? Like, how because I, I know how I, yeah. Say Izzelgun. Izzelgun? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds yeah. best to me. Yeah. You come across an Izalgan uh, trader, which is a rare sight on Absalom Station since they're, you know, from Izal 4 uh, and have only just recently joined society at large, uh, who has four lots of this porkite for you to bring out to, we'll say, Vesk. Vesk 7. I think Vesk 7 is the Patra, right? Patra home planet. It is indeed. Oh, wow. I'm so good at this game. Um, so I win. I win at remembering random pieces of information that I'll never use except in a game. So uh, you all my are able, able to load this on. Uh, we'll say uh, it takes you, you know, a second day to load four lots. Uh, go ahead and roll me 3d6 to get out to the vast, uh, in near space rather. You got it. That is 12 days. Divided by two, because we're fast. Six. Yeah. Now, I'll let you keep that. But were there any uh, were there any upgrades to the ship, Jet, as keeper of the ship in general? Uh, were there any upgrades to the ship that would affect this at all? Uh, no, no. We that was just me queuing up something for Tarika to do. We don't have the spare BP at the moment. We're trying to get some of that spare yeah. BP. Yeah, we got We got to make some BP. Yeah. Now, uh, on that note, it will. 
Let's Although see. we should we should look into boosting our engine again so that we can, you know, make more money in our downtime. Yeah. Uh oh. come to think of it, I needed to roll a D4. Ooh. These uh these lots are actually because you have to pay this buy this cargo handler uh to bring these out there. So these lots are going to cost you a total of three BP per lot. So how many BP did you have? before you set out on this venture. Nine. All right. So you can uh, you can salvage this. You'll just only be bringing three lots of cargo as opposed to four. So. Hold on. What? I got a line of credit. I don't know that that's a thing. I don't think we can do that. We'll, I think we'll, we just gotta we'll pay them back when we deliver we the, la- the, the four shipments. Yeah. Uh. That, that, could, that definitely won't go wrong. Certainly not. Now let me roll uh, another innocuous little die here as you're traveling for six days through the drift. Are we saying that Sloan wouldn't try to argue for uh, an extended line of credit? Because it's on brand. It is oh, on no, brand. I think she would. Uh, I'm just saying I don't think I have the, the mechanics to back that up right now. That's I have fine. to step away for just a second. Bertram's having an emergency. <laughs> No Not worries. a scary one, just a what inconvenient one. <laughs> yes, I understand. Um, all right, so you are going to uh, get out to Vesk Seven and find uh, need to do the find a buyer activity. So go ahead and roll me another profession smuggler check, Sloan. All right, mm, I'll keep it. Yeah. Nine is terrible. Yeah, that's fair. And you might roll worse. I might so, roll worse. Yeah. All right. So you are going to be able to uh, find a buyer relatively easily. Uh, this stuff is, uh, it appears, this stuff is in high demand, in fact. Mm. Uh, so that is going to affect the price of this cargo. So you got a 26. The DC is 15 plus one and a half times your level. So that is uh, DC 25. So... Uh, oh, plus four is a DC. Uh, you've gotten a 30. So you have in- exceeded, you've exceeded the DC by five, increased the sale price of the cargo by one BP per lot. So let's do some quick maths. Uh, it's in high demand, which in this case is going to increase the sell price by one. You've exceeded the DC by five, which is also going to increase the sell price by one. Nick, uh, why don't you do me the honors of rolling a D8 to determine the price, the, uh, the base sale price of this cargo? Ooh. Five. So Spicy. plus two is seven times three is 21. Well, points. Times three is 21, and you are in a near space world, so the, the base sell price modifier is no change. So uh, this is going to be a total of 21 build points off of that nine that you started. Uh, nice. You Sweet. Yeah. yeah. That's a pretty good rate of, re- rate of uh, return. Yeah, indeed. On investment. Seems that people really want this poor kite stuff. Uh, it's a new discovery, we'll say, or recent discovery, and everybody wants to use it on their their new uh, starship parts and et cetera, et cetera. So, all right, uh, you want to try and find some cargo that might be going back to Absalom Station. Absalom Station. It's, yeah, we do. Is uh, it's going to negatively affect your base sell price modifier because every you know the there's a lot of it's a there's plan. a surplus of supply in Absalom Station, so it just makes it a little... Uh, That's fine. It's just a yeah. little bit of gravy on top, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Oh, and it's going to take you some time to get That's a crit, though. <laughs> well, all right. So you have... Uh, that's a 41. DC is 20. So you're going to be able to get the cargo that you want uh, for sure. Uh, now I've got two more... We've got farming video games or uh, meat cubes. So uh, farming video games. Farming video games. Even meat cubes. In, we've got meat cubes. You're selling meat cubes. So yay. Uh, Very sorry. My farming video yeah. game. Very sorry, Liz, uh, for your love. I wish to share this joy. Yes. The so you find some meat cubes and. <laughs> The uh, complication with this one is going to be right up front because these this cargo is perishable. Mm. Uh, so 
this is going to be uh, uh, if you don't deliver this in a set amount of days, and I, I think I'll tell you this up front because, you know, food would have this stamped on the package, right? So Right, it's got a um, festive fused by date on it. All right, the good news is I rolled 2d8 and got a 13. That was a pretty high roll. So if you deliver this in under 13 days, you will get the full price for it. Uh, if you get there afterward, after eight, after 13 days, 13 days, uh, so 14 up, you will... Reduce the sell price to one per lot, period. End of story. Um, I don't think it's possible for us to take 13 days to get back to Absalom Station. <laughs> well, then I guess it's not an issue, is it? No. Yeah. Because we're going to roll a d6 and then we're going to divide by two. Ah, uh, that's right. Yes, okay. Yeah, so. Uh, sorry, I was thinking 3d6 because that's what you took to get out there. We're going to take three oh. days to get back. But how fast we do this does determine what our uh, daily return on investment is. That's true. So, yeah, because you've spent you spent six days getting out there. You're spending three days getting back. Four days for loading and unloading. Thirteen days. All right, cool. So you arrive on Axelon Station. You're going to need to find a buyer. So roll me another profession smuggler check. Oh, you got it. That's 25. You have hit it right on the nose. You will not be able to increase the say, the base sell price of this. A re-roll. Oh, you know. I, I, I keep forgetting to uh, tell you the buy of these lots. Uh, so these lots are going to cost you uh, four build points per. So uh, you bought four of them, yes? Uh, yes. Okay, so that'll be 16 build points uh, to buy this cargo to sell. And then you've got a 25. So would you like to re-roll that? Um, I have three of these a day, so I might as well. Because it is only an eight. Oh, yeah. 34. That's better. That's way better. So that 34 plus four for your friends helping is going to be 38. Exceeds the DC by... 10. So you can increase your base sell price by 2, which is going to nice. offset which of course uh, we do. The minus 2 penalty for this being delivered to Absalom Station. Okay. So, that's fun. Uh, let, go ahead, roll me a d8. Alright, come on, big numbers. That's a 2. That's that's going to be a 2. Uh, I think in the past we have traditionally allowed rerolls to be used for these things, and we are a half hour out. If you would yeah, like. should we use one of our rerolls? I think we should. Do it. Yeah. Use an audience reroll. Do it. Uh, this one is from Ghost. Ghost says, it's alive! <laughs> Sloan, I think you can do better than that. Uh, hey. That's a four. Thanks, Ghost. Yeah, doubling their, uh, doubling the base price here. So, add a plus one to it. Do we have a plus one? We, it does Nine. say, we, we did do. say any roll. <laughs> Fine. Take take those build points. Uh, you got you got you know laid One over more the barrel time on with the high price from... of cargo. Jeez. So, all right. So you have a base sell price of five minus two for going to Absalom Station plus two for your exceeding of the DC. So this is a total of five build points per lot. So you are uh, you're making twenty uh, build points off of this sale. So nice. Yeah, and it is about at this time that Tarika uh, contacts you all and says that the ship is arriving at the Horse Eye Orbital Plate soon. Or rather, it's departing the Horse Eye Orbital Plate soon. So, uh, it's about time to leave the ship with Tarika. Uh, say your farewells for now. And Bye, ship. And head on to the Horse Eye Orbital Plate. So <laughs> I'm surprised they don't suspect us here. Honestly, <laughs> last time we were here, a very big ship disappeared. We don't know that they don't. During well, the they don't travel. know that it's us. Aren't we traveling under assumed identities? Again, yeah, I suppose. During all the travel, Gus has cooked meals for multiple weeks for Tarika, and they're all labeled the days <laughs> that she's supposed to consume them. Oh, <laughs> they're in the freezer. Oh. <laughs> Love it. So, 
you arrive at the horse eye orbital plate with little incident. Uh, you're able to take the a passenger ship over there li- again, like you did in book one, uh, taking two days total. All right. Yeah. Uh, after you disembark from the shuttle, you pass through a security station where your fake ar- fake identities are given a cursory inspection. Of course, you know I've got to ask, uh, what is everybody's fake identity here? Uh, starting with uh, Jet. Uh, As I see Simon agonizing over this sudden improvisation. Um, in the ha- in the past, I've used bus, but I, f- I think I used bus here on the plate, so I've got to do something different. Yeah. We could start with uh, Auntie Nuna. All right, go for it. All right, Auntie Nuna is posing as the matron of a Kasathan um, clan, and the uh let's see Sloan is her assistant um and then gus catch and uh Mareoff are her bodyguards oh i was gonna say butler gus could be your butler oh yeah please be my butler oh yeah i've got formal wear but it's missing the sleeve over the prosthetic again. And Gus, in order to better disguise himself, he has willed his nanites to change his, like, resist inscription. It now says, oppress. Because <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Wooster, Wooster, get me my diamond-covered cigarette case. Yes, Mom. Fantastic. He's holding a, he's holding a parasol for you. Yes, absolutely. If anybody has any any more of their fake identity that they want to share, great. If not, I am happy to to move on. Uh, no, this is fine. This is great. This is fine. Everything's fine. Uh, you are muted, Leif. Catch doesn't put on uh, doesn't really change clothes beyond like the sunglasses. I feel like his uh, his greaser attire is menacing enough to be security attire oh no i want i want catching like a suit with oh. like a high collar and so like the tattoos peeking out from the collar only make him scarier Ooh. you heard how how catch looks in a suit <laughs> <laughs> no no this is like this is a well-fitted suit yes like i am a, went, i am a high-end bodyguard who is paid tailored. very very well to hurt you a you little went, thing you in went, your got tailored suits got it Catches a at first, glasses. but then once he sees it on him, he's like, oh, <laughs> all right. Nice. I look good in this. Oh, yeah. Man. How do we dress up Maria? Yeah, no, no, I've got something for it. Um, we have compression. You're we like put him in a yeah, you're bringing luggage, right? So I'm. So we are just a really embarrassing bug infestation in your laundry bag. Catch, catch will be carrying a suitcase of of Marriott. Marriott. <laughs> I, I was gonna say you just have a bow tie floating in your colony. <laughs> you know, it's funny because there is the horse eye orbital plate has a lot of anasites, and the security guards that are checking you in are in fact anasites because this is orbiting Avalon, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. Um, and there is the Abalonian uh, drone box, which is just a suitcase that you open up a number of times per day, and it provides uh, like a cloud of these uh, robotic little bugs, this swarm of bugs, if you will, uh, that provide you concealment. So uh, Maria being in a suitcase is oddly appropriate and might even pass. Catch. No one blinks an eye sensor. Yeah, no, catch a okay. sleight of hand that as, as much as needed. Sure. Uh, it's it's fine. You all get through. Um, so you can make your way through the interior of the station to the docking bay of this commerce barge, a ship called the Golden Thread. Anasite workers and security patrols move through this area. Uh, if they spot you without a staff escort, they probably sound an alarm. But you know the layout of the station, allowing you to uh, relatively easily avoid detection. However, as you all approach the Golden Thread's docking bay, you hear a whir of machinery coming from down the hall. Uh, you have some time before they get here, it sounds like. Uh, they don't sound too close. So you have a few options. Uh, you can either all attempt stealth checks uh, as a group, or attempt a computer's check to, uh, one computer's check to hack the local system and trigger a nearby, nearby door alarm. 
Oh, so what do you uh, want the computer? I think we probably want the computer check, right? I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Because guess what? Four-handed hacker. <laughs> <laughs> Can we your bonus? Or a lot? Sorry, what? What's your bonus to computers? Uh, it is fifteen, and I have ex- I have a expertise die. That's fair. Mine's plus twenty right now. Ooh. <laughs> 29 plus 6 is 35. Uh, you, that would be a critical success were we playing Pathfinder 2 because the DC here was 25. So uh, Auntie Nuna is able to hack the local system. She hurries over to a computer terminal that's you know nearby on the wall and triggers a nearby door alarm uh, the opposite, to, back the way you came uh, in the opposite direction. Here you are going. So the whir of machinery sort of fades as uh, as they retreat. So you are able to enter the docking bay of the Golden Thread. As you do so, uh, as you do so, um, you uh, you know once again hear Tarika's voice sort of in your memory, uh, a la a heist movie. Uh, windfalls are mostly automated. A skeleton crew can operate one. You're probably looking at a team of four mercenaries. Now, they're just working stiffs, just like you, so uh, maybe don't murder them if they find you. Maybe, you know, incapacitate them, non lethal oh, You're professional. Real hard. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you buy a few mercy here. fusion seals. I can't use them. <laughs> what? I cannot manufacture magical abilities on my manifested weapons. You can't get any... F- There's no way to apply fusions to them? Well, there There no. is in right. like another level or two if I take a specific knack that will allow me to generate them myself, but otherwise I have to manifest a weapon, carry a giant weapon around and stick a fusion steel sick- sticker on it or whatever. Oh my I God. guess I'll just be attacking with a minus four then. Yeah. yeah. Now, there is also, can you, you can put on, um, oh, it might be hybrid though. Hybrid probably counts. Can you put on hybrid things? Can you create hybrid things with your uh, manifestation? Uh, purely technological is my understanding. All right, then never mind. So, uh, after about five minutes, you all, uh, well, actually, here, let me bring you to, let me show you a map. Um, Oh, wait, no, I don't need to show you a map yet. You're able to find a suitable hiding space uh, on the on the ship. Uh, I will tell you where you go. Is it because I am I am in control of this of this story. You you all probably find yourselves in the uh, in area five, which is a very nice recreation suite. Um, first thing th- that you notice about this ship as you're entering is it is massive. This is uh, this is a very very large ship, uh, so much so that Tom actually had a hard time lining it up on roll twenty as a map with the grid because yes, I do have a map of this for you all to explore. Um, second thing, it is obnoxiously ornament ornamented. Uh, very ostentatious, you might say. It's uh, gold everything. It's it's a theme of gold and white. Uh, so you'll see a lot of that as you are going through. Yes, uh, gold and white are, of course, the colors of the Calistocracy, the prophets, uh, the prophecies of Calistrade, uh, which we will talk more about going forward. But uh, a little teaser is it's capitalism, the religion. Um, <laughs> so Abadar? <laughs> uh, yes. Abadar is more Lord. like... A law slash civilization, the religion. Yeah, yeah, they're they're yeah. Um, but yeah, the prophecies of Calistrade, in a nutshell, are get as much money as possible to preserve your immortal soul in heaven. So it the is Ferengi. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what that is. Yeah, they're the big aliens. Star from Star Come on, Tom. No, what did Jet say? Because the Ferengi, Ferengi? the ear dudes. They're Star Trek. They're, they have giant ears. Their entire civilization and religion is built around money. I said, okay. Um, yeah, so so I guess the Abadar versus Prophets of Calistrate. I feel like maybe the, the best comparison is Abadar is still in favor of, like, government social programs. Yeah. And Prophecy of Calistrate is very against 
any of those those handouts. Shades, yeah, they're like the dark avatar. Anything. They're dark avatar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, not, not they're evil. also they're in favor but. of like. Uh, uh, it's kind of yeah. It's it's a bunch of contradictions, yeah. honestly. Uh, I don't. I don't. Yeah, but well, an avatar is civil, like like Simon said, civilization. Right. So like there there is banking, but it's not capitalism; it's civilization. Yeah, mm-hmm. there is the bank of avatar, right? Like avatar right. is obviously well, pro bank because it's just you know somebody need they, people need a place to keep their money, and like right. if you go back to the Pathfinder days, like avatar churches were also banks, but it's because like people need safety deposit boxes and things. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe more like credit unions than banks. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, after about five minutes of you all sort of... Uh, you, you find a decent place to hide in this room. Um, and after about five minutes, you hear footfalls coming from the same airlock that you entered. The, the airlock to this ship is in the aft. Soon, uh, you presume that this is the crew of the ship entering. Uh, soon after that, the ship lifts off and enters the drift. Uh, so you're on a strange ship in the drift. Uh, you might I suggest hacking the ship's computer to uh, you know determine its layout and the location of your future riches. Oh, absolutely. I think Perfect. we can do that. Uh, the good news is both of those computer checks are unneeded because you have keys to the kingdom like i said you you right, have right. all the security codes for this ship uh and so catch and Nuna are both able to easily access uh the systems of this ship uh, since you have all the passwords and clearance codes thanks to tarika so you get a map of the ship and i will share this with you now the golden thread comptech Commerce, wind class, uh, windfall class starship. So, do, 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 do. it looks like a fall guy. Oh, it does a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it always reminded me a little bit of a starfish with the sort of the fins going off uh, to to various sides in gentle curls. So, you get there's a lot of things to do on this ship. It turns out you've got. The airlock, it has uh, incredibly more cargo space than uh, the severance package. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cargo holds. They are wow. all the twos, uh, which means they could hold seven lots of cargo. So, Whoosh. yeah, quite a, this is this is a hefty boy, but that's a lot of treasure. Uh, and then the, uh, you got escape pods, you got a rec suite, mess hall, galley. Uh, there's a guest stateroom. Uh, which is, uh, that's another point of interest, uh, in Area 10. Uh, there's a private bathroom, the bridge, and that's that. So. Is there some way, do we know where the um, crew is likely to be? Yeah. Uh, you see some, where is it? We want to be where the people. <laughs> you don't want to be where the people are. No, you no we do. We want to go tie them up. And oh, I see. Well, if we can, like, lock them into one room, that would be ideal. Or that. That works, too. Yeah. Uh-huh. As long so as it's not... I want to be where the people are, though. Uh-huh. At least near where the people are, without them seeing us. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, before that, you probably want to know the location of your, your, you know, your bounty of riches, right? Right. I just assumed it was the seven treasure holds. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Uh, so... Yes, that is where that is where treasure is kept. So the manifest uh, the manifest on this uh, ship, however, doesn't appear to have any treasure logged on the ship currently. Well, that's unfortunate. Who could have seen this coming? Maybe it is. Maybe the manifest is lying. Maybe the treasure is hidden. Maybe to avoid taxes. They hate uh, taxes. Ketch and Nuna will, uh, will you know, as this conversation is happening, uh, you both will, uh, sl- it'll slowly dawn on you. According to the ship's manifest, uh, the golden thread is headed to a transfer station called Fortune's Heart, 
somewhere in the drift uh, where it will pick up valuable cargo, your treasure, perhaps. Uh, mm-hmm. The mercenaries no, board. Yeah. What was that? Please can continue. Oh, the mercenaries aboard are guiding the ship to this station, but will then disembark and depart uh, once they have delivered the the empty ship. So, according to the ship's navigation computer, you are on track to arrive at Fortune's Heart in just under six days. So, wait. So, the ship is going to Fortune's Heart. The mercenaries are getting off. The ship is being loaded. Who? Are the mercenaries coming back on? Who's going to be on the ship? You don't know? Mm. A complication. Yes, this complicates things. Well, if the ship isn't being loaded until it gets there, does the, the, does the computer say, is there anywhere the mercenaries aren't allowed while they're escorting the ship? We can just lay low until they load up the new stuff. So, um, you, uh, the only area on the ship that seems to have a door, all the doors, you can see, all the doors on the ship are unlocked currently, save for area 10, the guest stateroom. Uh, so, Let's go take over the stateroom, then, until the mercenaries leave. As is only suitable for Marm here. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, we don't, don't need to stay in character, it's just us. We don't even need to abduct the ship until from these guys, right? Like, because we want it to go to the place it's currently going. Yeah, yeah, we do. We could just hide until the second leg of the journey. I think that's what Sloan was suggesting. Oh, okay. That's what the captain was saying. Hide in the stateroom. I mean, we could hide here too, but the doors don't lock. It could also. Six days. It, mm-hmm. it could also be locked because there's somebody in there. No, obviously not. It is a big ship. I don't think we don't think that it will be hard to hide. There's four people. There's seven cargo holds. Yeah. With some uh, clever planning, you could definitely avoid the notice of right. uh, of these mercenaries. Um, so okay. yeah, your, your options as they stand are, you know, as Sloan initially said, uh, you could tie up the mercenaries or you could hide. Uh, you could you as well just put... lay low and let them do their mm-hmm. jobs. Like if they find us, we could always bribe them or tie them up. Or but... lie to them. You're very good mm-hmm. at lying. Yeah. Surprise inspection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you remembered your psychic paper, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Good. Well, that is a very appropriate time for us to uh, to end the episode today. I think without getting into other stuff, because uh, I mean, of course, these six days are just going to go perfectly normally, and everything's absolutely. Fine. Of well, course, nothing nothing will compromise the situation whatsoever. But in case it does, we better end it here. So. Um, now let's see. Let's see. So I got my closing so as always uh, a new cosmic crate episode should be dropping tonight uh i know i got my patreon release either yesterday or today for uh, dead men roll no crits uh which is now releasing i think simultaneously as uh their attack of the swarm run so go over check out cosmic crit uh jet what's going on this thursday uh, we still have a little bit of exploration to do, and then the, whatever happens after that shall remain secret until it happens. <laughs> oh, how mysterious and secret. Um, now, for next Sunday, uh, I wanted to give you all a heads up, and Jet, uh, if you would actually bring us back to the, uh, the Roll20 screen, because I have a uh, handout for you of a promotional image. This promotional image has a picture of Leo Glass on it, uh, which implies something to do with Leo Glass. Yes, next Sunday, in fact, we are going to be having Mr. Leo Glass on for an interview, discussion, chat. Uh, He is the writer of book two of Fly For Your Die, Merchants of the Void, and all around cool guy. So if you have any questions you'd like answered by him pertaining to Paizo stuff, 
generally. Uh, send them my way on Discord. You can just feel free to private message me on Discord or to our email account at, all one word, nonstandardaction at gmail.com. Uh, the, this is going to be a really fun time. You're going to get to see him. Uh, he is a self-professed huge fan of the show, which is super flattering uh, in the first place, but we're huge fans of his work. And so it's going to be a really fun time to uh, pick his brain on how, you know, he, he's going to give us a report card on how we did playing his book, right? If we played it the right way. He's I got hope it. so. B plus. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. A That's plus. what this is for. So, uh, um, so yes, again, questions. We need questions. Um, I've come up with some. We, we need questions that need answering. Uh, so um, feel free to send them our way. So, people to thank. Uh, Leif, thank you for running our audio through Groovy. Who do we have to thank today? Um, first, I'm going to thank you for that uh, weekly required Lord of the Rings reference. Um, of course, it's in my contract. Yes. But then, of course, uh, for music today, we are thanking um, Ritamin and Relax Cafe Music, and this time around, Lo-Fi Girl, who just uh, confirmed uh free use of of um, all her music for uh for streams and such which is totally 100 percent awesome indeed love that lo-fi girl um our character art was done by any cola she is at any cola on twitter that is e-n-e-c-o-l-a on twitter uh hit her up for some commissions Thank you to Paizo for the wonderful AP, and specifically Kendra Lee Speedling, Speedling for writing book four. Uh, this is going to be a really good one. It's going to be uh, yet another departure from the typical, uh, the typical uh, Firefly. Well, no, this is this is very Firefly once again, uh, but it's it's going to be a departure from the typical running jobs constantly like this book three was and i'm is it paul yeah, just reading like on job. twitter something about this book starting as the train job and then morphing <laughs> into something else Ooh. i don't remember what it was who said that uh uh might have been jason toronto but i might be misremembering uh that jason tondro um all i can say is don't read the back of the book please uh <laughs> i only know what twitter tells me Paizo employees spoiling things on Twitter. Paizo employees. We're going to have to talk to... That's another thing to put on the docket for Leo Glass. Um, <laughs> don't be uh, yelling do at all. My whole life, follow everything Paizo on Twitter. We're going to have to talk to their moms. That's what the yeah, is there. They're collective Paizo mom. So, uh, mom? thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, who is the Paizo mom? <laughs> who, who, do we ta- who do we tell when... when uh, oh, my God. When people are, are uh, you know, spoiling things on Twitter. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick, for our stream assets and uh, just more evidence of uh, the stuff that Nick does. Uh, they created this little promotional tag for Leo's interview. Very excited uh, for you to see that next week. Uh, oh, timing specifically on Leo Glass interview. It will be an at the last hour of our stream, so we'll probably we'll cut the gameplay a little short at about two and two hours forty five minutes in, and then we'll take a quick break to get things set up, and then we'll be in. So you can count on that happening at three p.m. EDT uh, next Sunday, June twenty seventh. But I got off topic. That's very out of character for me, I know. But I was saying thank you, Nick, for running, uh, for making our stream assets. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. As well as Jet for running the stream. Thank you, Jet. You have been doing fantastic. Uh, all of my players have been doing fantastic. So thank you for continuing to play the AP with me. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, volunteering me as tribute for running this one. Uh, I have running. greatly enjoyed it. Uh, it's it's a treat. Uh, running for you all. You're welcome. And thank you, finally, all uh, our viewers and or listeners for joining us. We hope you are enjoying our story. So join us in the Discord after the stream to chat with us live. Uh, you can uh, feel free to feed me questions there uh, for this interview. I'm not going to stop asking you for questions. Uh, oh, obligatory uh request for jet for icebreaker questions as well yes, we could always please. use more icebreaker Thank questions you. <laughs> yes uh you can find a form pinned for that in general and feedback i want to say 
So, info and feedback. Info and feedback. Close. I was close. So uh, this in this outro is done. Uh, it is time to say goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. And Jet, why don't you take us in?